Um, in 2003, uh, the Inkbridge, the idea for the Inkbridge was born. Uh, the, the asylum seeker debate was in full swing then. Uh, I'm sorry to say that nothing much has actually changed. Um, and really what I wanted to, wanted to do was to examine the, the asylum seeker debate and, and present them as being decent human beings um, with hopes and dreams just like ours and that we had more in common uh, than we had difference and that the differences were actually something to be celebrated and we could, um, yeah, we could learn something from that. So yeah, I guess I was trying to dispel some of the myths surrounding asylum seekers and the, and the fears that we have. Um, in, in 2003, I, I started researching the Inkbridge and went to speak to a woman called Jackie Whitwell at the Refugee Council of Australia. And she told me that the, the people having the most trouble um, coming into Australia were actually the Hazara uh, minority of Afghanistan. And through that, I started researching Afghanistan and the country and the people and that sort of thing. Um, but I guess I'm, I'm something of a, a method writer and I like to go to the places that I'm writing about, I like to feel what they're like and, and smell the smells and all that sort of thing. So I, um, luckily in 2008, I applied for and got a, an Australia Council grant. And in 2009, I was able to go there. And I guess Afghanistan was, was never really a country on my radar to travel to. Um, but the more I read about it, the more fascinated I became about, became about it. Um, it was a little nerve-wracking when the Australia Council actually gave me the money to go there. I, um, <laughs> I thought it terribly irresponsible, <laughs> but I guess um, it was, I, was, I was quite nervous but also very excited about the prospect of going there. And I remember going into the travel agent in Eltham and booking my ticket and she'd never booked a ticket to Kabul before, um, funnily enough. And I just remember thinking, this is, this is real, this is going to happen. It was a very exciting moment. I guess pretty much all of Afghanistan is pretty exciting and interesting, um, but I think the most, the, the, the moment that sticks in my mind right now is, is driving from the airport. I guess that was the most electrifying experience in my life. Everything was very new and um, I, I basically, I had a, my journal with me the whole time and I was, I was writing it down as I, as I went. I'll actually, I'll actually just read you a little bit from this very messy journal. Um, and it just talks about, about the, uh, the, the trip in from the airport, just basically in notes, but it'll give you some idea of what I was, the flashes of experience I was getting. So 21st of July, 2009, Kabul, taxi from airport, blue burkas, ice cream sellers, sandbag gun stations, piles of firewood, horse carts, dust, diesel fumes, mud houses, Hindu, Hindu Kush National Model School, piles of tyres and fuel drums, new high-rise, watermelon stalls, Karzai billboards. This was around the time of the, the elections, so there was a lot of political stuff around. Giant compressors on roadside, Kabul, Paris, wedding hall, stacks of firewood like bones, mountains looming, houses clinging, Kabul green wedding hall. Wedding halls are a really big business in Kabul. A lone red kite, Paravilla Banquet Hall, Armoured Vehicle Ad, Kalbi Asia Wedding Hall, a boy in a blue school shirt walks among ruined buildings. So that was basically, that was basically my impressions of first, uh, first arriving in Kabul. But I guess there were, there were many other things that happened as well. Um, I, was, I was a bit unprepared for the, um, uh, for the generosity and the kindness of the people of Afghanistan that they showed towards me when I was travelling around. Um, I think I went there looking for something that was a bit beyond what we see in the evening news, suicide bombers and drone attacks and that sort of thing that we read and see. Um, and I found that there, was, there were people, families picnicking at, at the lakes at Bundy Ami. Um, there were partridge fights in the small, um, small partridges they fought in the, uh, in the park at Sharanao in, uh, in, in Kabul. Um, there was the Kabul city centre, which was a, was a, a glitzy sort of uh, shopping centre where you could buy a latte and eat a piece of coffee cake, you know. Um, there was a Sikh fortune teller I met in Bamiyan. Um, 
I was also really surprised how peaceful parts of Afghanistan were, especially the Bamiyan Valley, which is probably, I'd say without a doubt, one of the most beautiful places I've ever been to. Um, and there were many, many other stories um, to tell, and I, yeah, I could keep going forever, but I'll probably stop there. I guess the most challenging part of the Ink Bridge was, uh, was writing an issue-based novel. Uh, I think when you care about a subject quite a lot, you can come across as being very preachy and, uh, and didactic. And basically, with my early drafts of this novel, that, that was the case. Um, I was very lucky that was a reader's report uh, done on, on the Ink Bridge. And this person said to me, um, basically, just tell the story. Tell the story about two boys and trust that your readers will make that jump. Uh, and that was a great piece of advice. It really was. I think young people hate being told what to think. And I think that's a fair, that's a fair sort of comment. Um, everyone hates being told what to think. But uh, I think it would be unfortunate for me to have actually shoved all that, that information in the way of the reader and expected them to, um, to swallow it all. So it was, it was good that I had to rewrite it. So that was probably the most challenging part. That was an issue-based novel and try to find a way to get this information across without appearing too preachy. Bridges are a recurring motif in, uh, in the Ink Bridge. Um, they're, 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 a great, they're a great thing. The more I started to research bridges, the more I realised what a, um, an amazing metaphor they were for a lot of things. They allow us to cross from one place to another without getting our feet wet. Um, we have lots of sayings about bridges, like build a bridge and get over it, um, um, burning your bridges, all these things about, about um, our lives and the way that bridges interact with us. Um, I think with the real bridges that I talked about in the novel, I also performed a metaphor, metaphoric function as well. Um, so the Patronus Towers in Kuala Lumpur, the sky bridge there, um, it, was, it was used to show uh, the link, how if you stood together with someone else you could be much stronger, and the link between Puravi, the Indian taxi driver, and, and Omed, and later on between Omed and Heck too, if you can go forward in time, I guess. Um, with the living bridges in Meghalaya, um, and that, that's sort of discussed in the, in the book, um, it was a beautiful story that I read about, about them weaving tendrils across rivers and growing this bridge. And I thought it was a very nice metaphor for what Arazu and Heck were doing with each other, starting to tentatively um, reach out towards each other. And of course, the Westgate Bridge, probably the biggest one of all in the novel. And um, it's got a, quite a, a terrible past. Um, it collapsed in the 1970s when they were building it. And I guess the old Fisho, Fisho who, was, who was working on the bridge um, symbolises his loss his loss of his friend, certainly, and his, and his workmates. And to heck also a similar sort of thing, the real loss, but also um, a symbol of that loss. Um, also, um, I, I think I'd like to maybe read um, just a little bit from the book where uh, Paravi is talking about the, uh, about the bridge in the Patronus Towers. He puts it quite well. See the bridge, said Paravi and Omid folded the tip of his fingers to a point not quite halfway up the two towers. Two brothers with one arm, arm out to the other, that is the sky bridge. Paravi put his hand on Omid's shoulder to show him what he meant. Is this not what a bridge is for? For reaching and touching? Once this bridge is built, it is forever, and you can cross it at any such time. So that's basically what um, Paravi said about, about the bridge, and I think that's quite, quite nice. Um, that link between two people that he's, he's talking about there. And of course, Heck's dad is a, is a bridge designer. And it's, it's quite ironic that although he designed bridges for a living, he is an, unable to build that bridge that will reach to his son. Uh, hopefully that comes to a, um, a resolution by the end of the novel. Um, but I guess, and the ink bridge, of course, the final bridge of all, is a metaphor um, for the connection between Heck and Ahmed. Um, they're connected by the written word and Omid actually entrusts Heck with his, his, uh, his life story basically, the story of his, his fleeing Afghanistan and of his family um, for Heck to write. And that's the bridge between those two guys, that trust and, and that connection with the written word. 
I think my favourite character in Ingbridge is Paravi, the Indian taxi driver. He's uh, he's kind, he's funny, and he has a he's a very complicated history. Um, I, I think the reason that I, I wrote this character is because I have a quite a long history with India. My my mother was born there, and all her side of the family were from there. My grandmother, my great grandmother. Um, so I, and I've travelled there quite a few times, and I think Paravi, in a way, was my homage to all the great. Indians that I've met over there, um, the the amazing eclectic sort of characters, and yeah, some of the some of the compassion and and, um, and beauty in these people. So yeah, Paravi, I'd have to say Paravi, definitely. The hardest character to write in the bridge was uh, was Olmed. Uh, the reason being, uh, I was writing outside of my culture and I was a little bit uncomfortable doing that. In the in the early drafts of the Ink Bridge, um, he was written in the first person too, so I was very close to him. And I'm very mindful of the fact that I'm writing about a culture that I don't belong to, the Hazara culture, and I hope that I've, I've got it right. I hope that I have and I apologise to any Hazara out there who, um, yeah, if, if I have got anything wrong, I've, I've got to say that my intention was to, to try and get everything right. Um, in the later drafts, uh, I put Omid in the third person um, and further distanced him through heck writing about him. So I think that was just a little bit of a, um, a way of me trying to remove myself a little bit, uh, a little bit of protection for myself, I guess. But he was also a really rewarding character to write. I found out a lot about him and probably one of the, the more exciting characters to write. He's a, he's a great character. He really is. Okay, I think initially with the research for the Ink Bridge, um, I, I looked a lot at the internet, um, read books, um, read reports. Uh, there was a lot of stuff in the news at the time, certainly in 2003. Uh, then I went a bit further and started contacting some of the, um, some of the asylum seeker and refugee advocacy groups. Uh, the Refugee Council of Australia, um, Rural Australians for Refugees, and the Asylum Seekers Resource Centre, which is based here in Melbourne, and I actually taught um, uh, English, home English tutor for, uh, for the ASRC. And that sort of gave me a bit of an insight into, into the lives of some of these people. Um, I also uh, managed to contact, through one of the groups, uh, a young man called Sada Shinwari, and he'd arrived uh, from Afghanistan into Australia um, at the age of 15, and he was put in detention for three and a half years in Baxter Detention Centre. And I, I started calling him. And it was, it was heartbreaking sometimes. I'd see the ebb and flow of his hope as things changed. Uh, he kept himself busy, he played cricket, he, um, he worked while he was in the detention centre in one of the stores there. So he was keeping himself quite active. And then in December of 2004, I, um, I Sada got out of detention and we managed to meet at the, uh, the Melbourne Zoo of all places, which was quite ironic for him to see other, other beings behind bars, I guess. Um, but yeah, that's, that was probably just another point in his journey. He's still, he's still, um, he's still going, he's still um, living in Australia and, and trying to sort out so that is life. It's, it's a tricky thing being a refugee. It's very hard. But yeah, that was, that was some of the research I did into the, into the refugee and asylum seeker process. I, I hope that readers can take away, um, I guess, get a little bit of an insight into the life of a refugee or asylum seeker. I, I feel a little bit conceited by, by answering this question because my hopes for this book, I don't know, they're, um, <laughs> they, I don't want to make them seem too grand, okay? I just hope that people people can learn a little bit about asylum seekers and, and take it a bit further themselves. Um, I hope that they can sit down next to an asylum seeker or a refugee um, on, a, on a bus or a tram um, and talk to them and find out their stories. Um, and maybe, maybe that can that can go on um, to these, especially young people who are reading this book, to maybe changing the way these people are treated. Um, but that's a very grand hope for my book. Um, I just hope people read it and get something from it. I guess. Um, I think, 
I think people basically have this spark of human decency inside them that's just waiting to be fanned. Um, maybe that's a hope. Maybe that's a hope for the book. We'll see.